Data Color 2013 webinar series. I'm David Toby. I'm Global Product Technology Manager for the line of Data Color products that you probably know as the Spider products. And I'm here with my long distance photo friend, David Saffer, in California. I'm a little jealous because I got to shoot with David last month in California and it did not look anywhere near as beautiful as the shot on your screen which he took just a couple of days ago. So I clearly missed my, uh, missed my window for spring photography in California. Now today we have a co-sponsor. We're happy to have Trek Pack co-sponsoring this webinar and providing also a, uh, a door prize. So at the end of this event we're going to give away a spider product and a Trek Pack product together to one lucky viewer. And we'll also have discounts listed at the end of the webinar. So stick around for those. Now as is often the case in this webinar, one of us will lead and one of us will answer questions. So today it's my turn to man the keyboard and it's David's turn to uh, man the presentation. So this is uh, going to be a, a David Saffer presentation with possible occasional comments by me, but mostly I'm going to be um, dealing with, with questions as they come up in the chat window. So set your system up so that you can see the chat window and I'll answer all questions in the public answer mode so that you can all get the benefit from them if they're of interest to you. So I'm going to uh, <clears throat> turn this webinar presentation over to David Saffer and let him introduce himself and, and get started. Thank you all. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today we're going to talk about what's in your camera bag. And, you know, it seems like a simple title, doesn't it? It's, um, gee whiz, I have a camera bag, and uh, gosh, what's in it? But the idea is uh, really has a number of aspects to it. One of them is have the right things in the camera bag for the situation at hand, but also to have the things in the camera bag that harmonize, that work together to help you be a better photographer and to help you make better images. So some of the things to consider. By the way, this photo was taken in the um, Slot Canyons, uh, the um, Antelope Canyons in near Page, Arizona. And uh, as you can see, they're very dramatic. The light is very, uh, very interesting. These are underground streams. The water has carved a channel through the rock, and there are holes in the uh, ceiling, as it were, that allow light to come through at certain times of day, and that's the effect that you see here. So some of the things you think about when you're planning uh, to put your gear together uh, to go out for even a few hours or a day is um, What's your style? You know, who's the photographer? Of course, it's you or, or one of your friends or colleagues. What's their style? What are they going to need to accomplish um, their stylistic goals? What's the subject? Is it landscape or macro, portrait or still life? And when will the images be made? I mean, the time of day and time of year are, are important, if, if for no other reason than <laughs> what kind of uh, outdoor clothing you'll be, be, uh, be using. Where will you be shooting? What's the location? Uh, indoors or outside? What's the weather going to be like? Is the sun going to be coming from one angle or another vis-a-vis -vis your subject? How will the images be captured? Do you have digital or, believe it or not, film? I have a friend who still shoots a 4x5 ebony. Are you going to be shooting handheld or on a camera support? And how much time is it going to take? Is it hours or days? You know, how far you are from home or how far away you are from technical help can make a big difference. Do you need spares? Do you need a second camera body? Questions that need to be answered before you walk out the door. So it does depend on the job at hand. From small to larger scale, um, you can go on a short walking or on location excursion and take a bag like the one on the upper right um, and carry a camera and maybe an extra lens. Um, sometimes you're really shooting landscape and possibly macro or exterior interior architecture, uh, panoramas. Um, you know, you have longer projects and even events. There's a, a lot of people that are on our attendee lists that are event wedding shooters and things like that. And if you're going to an event, well, that's a little different than going outside and shooting wildflowers. So the short and sweet, you know, I always keep a small bag by the door. 
Um, doesn't look quite like this. This one's pretty nice. Um, but it has a Canon G10 and an extra battery and some memory cards and a lens cloth and a little tripod and a couple of other things. And we'll talk about these. And it's ready to go. So when I walk out, I can almost always take a camera with me. It's also good for short expeditions or um, you know, excursions if you're working in a crowd or you're climbing on rough terrain. Um, it's about speed and convenience and lightness, um, a little bit of agility, being able to move easily from one place to another. Um, it's nice and light and portable. Um, some of the other cameras that, that you may consider for this task might include the Fuji X1 or the EX1, the, uh, the Sony RX series, the Nikon V series, um, or really any camera or point and shoot. So let's talk about that sort of scenario. In fact, I was um, with David Toby. Um, I think it was back in February, wasn't it, David? And we were walking through Mission Canyon in Santa Barbara. And I noticed across the canyon, uh, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. I noticed across the canyon the light was coming through these oak trees. And steep slope. Uh, terminating at the bottom with uh, an oak rail fence and then another steep slope down to the stream bed and um, and then a, a small ridge line with the trees on it and then the land falls away. This is actually going downhill at quite a pace all the way to the ocean. And the light coming through was really remarkable and I thought, gosh, this would really be a great shot. And the fence was in the way, which this actually happened in a couple of sh photos I'm going to show you uh, during this presentation. And so what I did was I had the, um, the Fuji um, X1 Pro with me, and I braced it in the corner of the fence where the fence post meets the fence rail. And I very carefully um, uh, pushed the shutter. And, and, and considering the light and the detail that I wanted to capture in the shadows, um, it was just long enough an exposure that camera movement would have ruined the shot. So I took several shots um, thinking that there's going to be a casualty rate and I'm going to maybe one out of three is going to be satisfactory, which is exactly what happened. But the idea was is that I didn't use a tripod for the shot. I used something that was close at hand. And I had a small light camera with me, and I got a very nice photograph with it. And we had planned this as a, as a casual, casual trip uh, up Mission Canyon. We drove up to the Botanic Garden and walked through it for an hour and a half uh, before sunset. And uh, this is the result. So this can be a very effective strategy, having a camera with you in a small bag, uh, and you can still produce really, really nice uh, high-level photographs with that kind of setup. Now, I did leave something out here. When I was talking about the, uh, the gear that goes in the bag, I want to talk about the Spider Cube for a minute because it's a very useful color control device, uh, color management device. And the Spider Cube is um, a little bit, uh, has some roots in the gray card world, but it's much more sophisticated. Um, it's really a unique design. Uh, it's made out of a material that's practically indestructible. It's multi-dimensional so that you can work off different surfaces and determine which is your primary light source, for example. Um, you can use it uh, in exposure management. You can use it to do in-camera white balance. And you can use it for post-production color and gray balance. And you can use it to help you manage your dynamic range. Um, AKA the zone system. So it's useful for handheld and tethered shooting and in post-production and studio and location work. Uh, there's another webinar that deals with the spider cube in detail on the data color website. Now things get a, a little more complex and maybe a little more demanding if you're doing a longer day walking tour or a weekend photo safari, um, you might step up to a larger camera. You might use a, a four-thirds camera with lenses, um, a mirrorless camera, or a small 
DSLR with an extra lens. Um, you can include any number of lenses, of course, a macro or a wide angle. Um, and here's something that I haven't talked about before in other webinars and extension to, which is very, very useful if you really want to get extreme magnification for a small subject. You can couple that with just about any normal lens or macro lens and really get close to your subject. Depth of field does suffer a little bit. Um, I would recommend that if you're making lens choices that the prime lens, in other words, the single focal length lenses are ideal uh, in terms of um, image sharpness and quality. There's a lot of smaller cameras that are sold with what I call all-in-one lenses, say an 18 to 200 millimeter. Um, but I have found that the image quality from those is okay, but doesn't quite measure up to a lot of the prime lenses. So you may think about, well, if I've only got a couple of lenses to carry on this particular trip, maybe they should be primes. Uh, I'd recommend a charger. And in fact, if you're working from a car or you're traveling in a car, uh, I found that having an, uh, a power adapter to connect the charger to the vehicle uh, outlet is very, very helpful. Uh, I would recommend extra batteries. Uh, I have found from time to time that batteries go bad or they didn't quite take a charge the way they were supposed to. And so an extra couple of batteries can really save your bacon when you're out in the middle of nowhere like uh, my friend is here shooting wildflowers. So you want to make sure that you have at least a couple of extra batteries. And I realize with some, with some of the smaller cameras that you can go, you know, two and a half months without charging the battery. I'm exaggerating. Um, but that also tempts you to not charge the battery or forget to do it. And so having extra charged batteries in the bag is a great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe overemphasizing this, having been bitten by it once or twice. Extra memory cards. Particularly the SD cards, they're fragile, uh, they're tiny, they tend to get lost. Um, I'd suggest also that you have a case for your memory cards to protect them. If you're out in the weather or there's dust around, um, that case can really do a nice job of protecting uh, your investment in your photographs. Let's talk a little bit about camera supports. Depending on what you're willing to carry, a, a middleweight tripod or a monopod, which is just a single leg with a camera mount at the top. A mini pod, which is like the Gorilla Pod, um, I'm name dropping, I have a couple of those. Or even a bean bag, and the bean bag can be empty. You can always fill it when you get there. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of this, the bean bag is simply a sack with a zipper on, or an opening on one end, and you fill it with material like rice or beans or sand, and it makes a great steady support for a camera when otherwise there isn't one available. The cameras we're talking about typically have on-camera flash. Um, if you really think you're going to be working in a darker environment, you may consider investing in a, um, a camera mountable flash, one that goes in a hot shoe. One of the items that I really uh, urge people to think about is at least a remote shutter release. The remote shutter releases uh, it depends on the camera. A lot of them have a mechanical mount where a, a threaded uh, device is screwed in, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, and they work quite well, and they're cheap. They're a couple of dollars. Or you can get a, actually get an interval timer, which can be used as a remote release or can be set up to take a series of photographs timed at intervals, say every 30 seconds or every 10 seconds. They're great for night shots. Um, they're great for creating um, sort of a stop-motion video effect, that kind of thing. Um, lens filters. Lens filters are something that people don't think about that much nowadays. You know, we have all these filters in Photoshop and Lightroom, and, and people say, oh, well, I'll do it in Lightroom or Photoshop. But sometimes the lens filters can really make a difference. And a couple of examples, a UV lens filter can really make a difference. Sometimes a polarizer is really necessary for killing reflections, say, in water that's not moving very fast or glass in an architectural shot, that sort of thing. Um, I also suggest that you consider, believe it or not, with all the HDR and things that people are doing, 
that a graduated density filter is sometimes makes life a lot easier. You can always take a shot with it and without it and make up your mind later about what you're going to do in post-production. If you have a small camera bag and say a lens, like a, a wide angle lens and a normal lens in the bag and there's no room for, for a, a, a long lens like a 200, uh, you can get a long lens case and I'll show you a photograph of that in a moment that you can hook to your belt. Uh, it's a little bit awkward. Um, you're starting to sort of feel like a Sherpa at that point, but it sometimes can be really helpful. Again, this young woman is out in uh, a wild area and lots of wildlife, lots of birds, burrowing owls are, are a big thing in this part of the country. People really like them. Um, there's a lot of raptors and other um, animals running around that uh, without a long lens, you have no chance of a shot. So it's something to consider. Um, you don't necessarily have to lug a giant camera bag. You can take the long lens with you when you get out of the car for a particular scene and then put it back in the car and continue. I also suggest that you, that you get one of the smaller or smallest collapsible reflectors and diffusers. Um, my favorite is Lastolite. Um, they're typically three in one, so they have a silver reflector on one side, a gold reflector on the other, and then a collapsible disc sandwiched in between that can be folded up, that can be used as a diffuser, say, for wildflower shots, macros, um, or even um, a close-in portrait. I've done that a few times. And, of course, a spider cube. So we'll talk about lenses here for a moment. There's a range of lenses. Um, now, these are Nikon designations, but there are Canon equivalents or close to equivalents. And these are just, like, like I said, examples. Um, the 10 to 24 lens is a good lens. It does have, um, like a lot of zoom lenses, a little bit of distortion at, at the extreme end. So at the, at the 10 millimeter end and at the 24 millimeter end, you're likely to see a little bit of distortion in the photograph in the corners, uh, maybe a little dark. David, thing. I would jump in there and say, if even if people are Zoom users, the one place where a prime is most justifiable is at the widest angle, rather than the rather high cost of a wide-angle zoom. Getting one fixed wide-angle lens and then zooming your way in the in the zone that starts somewhere above that is is one very good technique for uh, mixing lenses. Yeah, I have a, an old a mentor of mine from days gone past who said the best zoom you own is attached to the ends of your legs. Just walk in there and get closer. If the shot doesn't look good, you're not close enough. So that's something to think about. Um, the wide angle lenses here, the, the 17 to 35 is a particularly good zoom lens. Um, it does have some barreling at the 17 end at the 35, say from 20 to 35 it's pretty darn good. Um, and being a uh, um, fixed aperture 2.8, um, not a fixed aperture, a single aperture, it's not a variable aperture, um, 2.8, it tends to be a little bit better quality in terms of the glass. Uh, you'll see a little bit less or no vignetting in the corners. So that's, that's a lens. And by the way, when you're buying lenses, do consider um, buying them used. Uh, one of the tips is um, there's companies like Midwest Photo Exchange and KEH that have excellent warranties, uh, do a great job of servicing uh, customers that are purchasing used equipment, and you can also rent lenses for very little money, um, $25 for a weekend here in Southern California, and try them out. So there's a couple of tips for you there. The 24 millimeter 1.4 is a staple. A lot of people use it um, and walk around with just that one lens on the camera. Um, it's one of the better prime lenses that's uh, available through the 35 millimeter manufacturers. And of course, the normal lens, the 50 millimeter 1.4, is like night vision. That is great for a couple of things. It's really useful for uh, taking a photograph that that doesn't really how do I put this? When you're shooting with certain kinds of lenses, particularly the ones at the top of this list, in some way you're going to see the visual footprint of the lens in the photograph. When you're shooting with a normal lens, a 50, 
particularly on a full frame camera, you're not going to see that visual footprint. It's like your normal vision. That's why they call it a, one of the reasons it's called a normal lens. They're typically very, very good quality and they're typically quite light, very portable. Um, they're not very prone to lens flare like a lot of wider lenses. Uh, so that's something to think about too, is a 50 millimeter. And there's a lot of them around, in, particularly in the used departments. One of my favorite zoom lenses, in fact, the only one that I really like a lot is the 24 to 70 or the 28 to 70 f2.8. That's a workhorse lens. It's clean, sharp, crisp, doesn't vignette uh, from end to end. Um, I've owned one for a dozen years and it looks like hell and it works great. So if you were going to get one zoom lens uh, to walk around for almost any purpose events, uh, even portraiture in the studio because it's a constant aperture, um, outdoor photography where you're, you're, you just want to walk around with one lens, say, in town, um, it's fine for shooting even architecture, um, street scenes, markets. It's just phenomenally capable. And the 24 to 120 f4 is kind of the Swiss Army knife lens. It does a lot of things really well. Um, it's not going to be as sharp as the 24 to 70 or even as the 50 millimeter, uh, particularly at the ends. And there is a little bit of distortion at the ends of its range. But it's still a good lens. Now, let's just talk for a moment here about the cable release. This cable release is the old-fashioned kind, plunger style. It's got a screw-in mount that goes into the top of the shutter button on most cameras. Not all cameras. Some cameras require an electronic cable, uh, shutter release, and they're sold by the manufacturer. They're typically overpriced, but they won't kill your wallet either. Um, you're usually talking about $25 or $30. This one is about 2 and a half to $5, depending on where you get it. Um, one of the interesting things about the latest Fuji camera is that you can do both. Uh, and I thought that was very clever of their engineers. On the lower right, we have an interval timer. Some of the camera manufacturers make them. There are aftermarket interval timers. These can be set to take a picture once a day for a week. If your battery will last that long, they can be set to take a picture once every 30 seconds or simply used as a remote release. Um, the cables are typically six feet long. Um, this is a lens pen. They actually changed the design of this and I thought it was quite clever. Um, it used to be straight with the little dust sensor and the other end of this has a brush for your lenses. This is for cleaning the dust off the sensor in your DSLR, for example. Um, but what they did was they angled it so that you can actually see better what you're doing when you're trying to get that last little bit of crud off your sensor that's, uh, that's getting in the way of your photographs. So you may want to think about having one of these in your bag. I have one in just about every camera bag I own because you never know when you're going to need it. Um, I also suggest that if you have the room a blower brush, which is um, simply a squeezable bulb that, that pushes air out and has a little brush on the end, is, is great for cleaning the outside of your camera body. Um, and some other elements of your camera equipment. And on the top right is one of the larger lens accessory bags. You can see it has a strap that you can carry it over your shoulder. What you can't see is on the back is there's a, I guess you would call it a loop where you're, um, if you wear a belt, um, you can mount it on your belt. And I'll tell you right now, that, that's a little bit awkward. I generally carry these over my shoulder, um, but some people do carry them on their belt. Uh, Typically, the strap that comes on these is very narrow and relatively uncomfortable, and, and in many cases, the first thing I do when I get one of these is replace the strap with something better. Now, here's another photograph that we can talk about for a minute. I took this just the other day. Um, David Toby was here, and the hills were very, very green, and you know we had beautiful weather with blue skies. And, and of course, uh, it was a little bit early for the wildflowers. Um, you never know when they're going to come in California. Some years they're earlier than others. Some years they're later than others. Uh, and I got very lucky. We went out on a scouting expedition because we're working on a workshop um, located near my home. This is about a 40-minute drive from where I live. 
and we're going down a side road. Uh, for those of you in California, it was Route 223 um, near Arvin, little town. Uh, it's a more of a wide spot in a road than a town. And the road is just two lanes with a very narrow shoulder, a drainage ditch, and a barbed wire fence. And so there's no place to put up a tripod where you can take the photograph without the barbed wire fence in it. So I slogged through the muck and climbed the little hill up to the barbed wire fence. And I did, again, what I had done in Mission Canyon, which is I rested the camera on the fence, braced it against it, and I took the shot. I probably took five or six shots again. And this was running at around an 80th of a second. And I shoot medium format. So um, those of you familiar with that format will know that an 80th of a second can cause camera shake. And I'm shooting at ISO 50 at about f11. Um, so we've got nice depth of field. Um, this camera does a great job of rendering contrast and color in what you might call less than ideal conditions. You know, the lighting was very soft. We were getting close to the end of the day. Uh, and it was, you know, of course, quite overcast. So sometimes, even though you have the tripod with you and you have the big camera with the wide angle lens and, and such, you still have to improvise. And you know, maybe not everything in the bag gets used on every trip. Um, I didn't use a filter or anything like that. Um, in post processing, uh, I did typical levels and curves adjustments on this. I increased the saturation slightly because it was a little, a little bit flat in terms of the lighting, um, and that was it. So uh, you don't have to use everything you take with you. It's just a good idea to have the things that you might need at your fingertips uh, when circumstances uh, require them. Now, if we're talking about location work, serious location work, where you're going to go for a day um, for a client, you're doing commercial photography um, in a business. Um, I've got one of those coming up where you're going to travel. Um, I think the first thing to do is to make a checklist. I think it's important to have a checklist, at least for me. Um, make a checklist and, and stick it in the, the bag, in the pocket inside the bag, and keep it with you. And keep it in the bag. And so when you go to pack it, you have a pretty good idea of what the possibilities are. Now, for this category, I generally think of a mid-size or larger, which means almost a full-size backpack, um, you know, that kind of bag, and a full-size tripod. And I typically use a tripod with a ball head, such as one made by old Gitzo or Really Right Stuff. One of the things to think about is airline size restrictions if you're going to be flying. Um, it's real easy to get into trouble uh, to climb on a plane and find out that your, all of your camera gear is loaded in the bag, which will not fit in the overhead. Now, particularly on smaller planes, you can really get cornered by this. So what I suggest is, is maybe not buy the biggest bag, or if your budget permits, have a couple of bags, and have one bag that's in the international overhead size, which will fit almost anywhere, even the midsize or what some people call puddle jumper aircraft. Um, it's also easier to horse around uh, if you're carrying it through a crowd or even if you're rock hopping out in the boonies somewhere. Some bags will have tripod straps. Um, I think some are better than others. Uh, I'm not a big fan of carrying the tripod on the bag simply because it tends to ruin the balance of the bag. And if I'm climbing or I'm you know, climbing or descending or on rough ground, that balance issue uh, can become a problem. And I've actually fallen once or twice. And um, I typically will go slower and carry the tripod in my hand or put it on a separate strap and sling it somehow, but not mount it on the bag. Now, another thing is, is that if you're a long way from home, Let's say you've got the trip of a lifetime and you're in Kenya. I think you'd better have two camera bodies because it's only going to take one good shot. Um, you know, the, the Jeep goes uh, into a pothole or um, you do, and that camera body is toast. That's the end of your trip unless you have a second camera body. You can always get a lesser camera body that takes the same lenses or a used one. 
but have a second camera body if you have no recourse to a replacement. Uh, it can really save your trip or your, or your, uh, or your project. And you want a range of lenses. Um, the, you want the bag to have room for a 200 millimeter telephoto if, if you think you want to use it and then put a teleadapter in. Uh, the 1.4 gives better results than um, teleadapters with more magnification in 35 millimeter. Um, my Hasselblad has a 1.7 that works great, but I certainly wouldn't want to go higher than that. You want to think about what kind of shooting you're going to do, um, wide angle. I almost always recommend that people bring a macro lens uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're great for, for impromptu portraits. They're fast and they're sharp and they're not that big. Um, they have a little bit of reach. They're typically 60 or 100 millimeters, somewhere in that range. Um, so they're great portrait lenses. Um, you may want a normal lens. Uh, a zoom or a telephoto, and of course the extension tube weighs nothing, takes up no room, and gives you a lot of versatility up close. I also suggest that you consider getting an L-mount bracket. The L-mount bracket is a descendant of the, the, the plates that uh, we've always had that we've attached to the camera that lets us attach the camera to the tripod. So they, there's different types of mounting plates. But companies like Kirk and Really Right Stuff make an L-mount bracket that allow you to mount the camera in the horizontal position or flip the camera on its side and mount it in the vertical position, which is really great for, of course, vertical shots or panoramas. I like to take panoramas with the camera mounted vertically because I can get the sweet spot right in the middle of the frame that way. I suggest, I'm going to show you a couple, these next two things, a panorama mount or a macro mount. Uh, the panorama mount allows you to make much, you can make a panorama handheld just by being careful of how you hold the camera and managing your exposure and that sort of thing. But when you go to composite that panorama, you're going to lose a lot of the edges of those photographs because the camera isn't perfectly managed through the arc of the shots that you're taking. If you have a panorama mount, you're going to get to keep more of your picture, and that's the reason to have it. They're not cheap. They're about 100 bucks. Um, but they're worth it if you're into that kind of thing. You're going to get not necessarily better panoramas, but you're going to get more complete panoramas. And then if you decide to crop, it's your decision. It's not forced on you. Um, I suggest that you take extra batteries, extra cards, a spare charger. Um, I was overseas one time, and my charger broke. And you won't believe what it costs to have one FedEx from New York. Uh, overnight. That was something I'd read. It cost many, many times more than the charger for the shipping charges. So having an extra charger, it's a good idea. You want a power adapter if the power is different. And we're going to continue to the next slide. You want a bulb blower. We've talked about that lens pen, lens cloth. I'd have a couple of lens cloths, um, maybe even uh, two or three of them. Um, David, you've got a good story about having an extra lens cloth. Oh, yes. Well, lens glasses are good for many things. I carry one in my pocket constantly, but um, having an extra lens cloth allows you the luxury of using it for things you wouldn't use your only lens cloth with. I think what David is alluding to was one of my better shots from Tuscany last summer was uh, the cathedral in... Siena, which is a very decorative, lovely building, but that has a hundred people standing in front of it taking a picture of it at any moment. And in order to take something unique, I'm looking around and there's a, uh, a Fiat parked probably illegally right there in the square in front of the cathedral. And as I walk by it, I see the reflection of the cathedral in the back window of the Fiat. Well, here are two Italian icons in one shot, but of course, like any other Tuscan car, the back window is covered with that white Tuscan dust. So I sacrificed a lens cloth, cleaned the back window of some stranger's car, photographed the back of the car with the reflection of the cathedral, and got one of the better shots that I took on that trip. Now, uh, if the owner had come by while I was cleaning his back window, I would have just smiled and bowed a little and kept on doing exactly what I was doing. I don't believe it's anything that would have gotten me in trouble with anyone, but you know, it's that kind of thing. Uh, disposable items like lens cloths, shower caps for covering your, your camera, uh, trash bags for rain gear for you and your camera, those are all 
great things to having in your camera bag because of their disposability and the multiple things you can use them for. Yeah, I would have liked to have been there if you had a conversation with that car owner. Um, it could have been pretty cute. Uh, you want your filters in your bag. Um, and again, you don't need a whole array of them nowadays, but there are a few. Um, by the way, I, I, I mentioned a graduated density filter. A neutral density filter can help you with shots where you want to show movement, uh, even in bright light. And um, that's something that I've been getting into lately. And so um, you can reduce the number of stops of light coming into your camera by two stops or five stops or ten stops. Um, they make them in all kinds of, uh, you know, all variations. And they're not that expensive. And again, you go to the back of the camera store and look at the used or fire sale gear table and uh, dollars to donuts, you'll find one or two of them in there that might fit one of your lenses. You want to, you, one of the things that's really useful to have, believe it or not, uh, you know, that's the old saying, you can fix anything with WD-40 or duct tape, um, but at least have electrical or gaffer or duct tape in your bag. And my personal preference is black gaffer's tape, and I take an old medicine bottle, and I, I take a five-foot strip, and I just wrap it around that medicine bottle. And now I've got enough tape to maybe hold a partly broken tripod together or to prop something up out of the way, like a branch of a tree temporarily, just about anything. A, little, a length of string isn't a bad idea either for that kind of thing. Um, if you have a laptop, you want to bring a charger, of course, and bring a network cable. Um, everybody says, oh, who needs network cables nowadays? There's always wireless. Well, there's not always wireless, and sometimes there's not wireless that you would want to use. So I have found that probably one trip in three, I use the network cable uh, rather than the wireless to connect. You probably are going to, if you're, if you're doing any kind of tourist stuff or you're doing an event, um, you want an on-camera flash unit and you want a diffuser or a bounce card with it. Um, the diffusers are made by the companies that make the flash units. They attach to the flash. Um, you can also buy bounce cards or or diffuser devices from uh, third parties. Um, they're very, very useful. Um, unless you want uh, your photos to look like, you know, Ouija in New York on crime scenes back in the, in the 30s and 40s, you definitely want a diffuser on your on-camera flash. Um, I want you to think about having a spider cube with you. The spider cube is something that should be in every camera bag, in my opinion. Uh, you may want to have a spider checker, which I'll talk about, and a lens cow. Uh, depending on how long the trip is and what you're going to be doing. If you're going to be on a long trip, external hard drives, a lot of people who go on trips to places like Africa take two, and they take spare connecting cables and spare power sources. They even make arrangements with some of the colleagues that they're with uh, to trade backing up photos from their hard drive to someone else's hard drive, so they're actually in three places, which is the ideal, in my opinion. You want to have a flashlight, and frankly, I think a, a handheld flashlight and a headlamp can be useful. The handheld flashlight can be used for light painting at night, illuminating part of a building or uh, part of a landscape uh, to bring it into the foreground a little bit more. Uh, we've all seen that. And of course, the headlamp is great if you have to walk out in the dark, believe me. Um, it's, it's actually a safety issue because if you have to be climbing up or down, You've got, you know, at least one hand free, hopefully two, if you're using a headlamp. And of course, the light goes where you look. A couple of small plastic bags um, to protect your equipment, but also if you have to, um, in fact, I forgot this when I went and made that wildflower shot the other day and I got soaked. A plastic bag is a great thing to have if you just want to get down on one knee and take a photograph and the ground is wet. Um, it's a wonderful thing to put under your camera bag if the ground is wet. So a small plastic bag um, is a multi-purpose tool. A small toolkit and a couple of wide rubber bands. Why rubber bands? Well, if a filter gets stuck on a lens, you can wrap that rubber band around the filter and it gives you enough grip and leverage, you know, 99 times out of 100 to pop that filter loose so you can change it. 
uh, if you're going to be doing any kind of complex shooting or multi-light source shooting, you're going to want a radio or infrared control for remote flash. And of course, some of the 35 millimeter companies are making what they call commander units that go on the camera that will drive multiple remote flash units. Um, those are great. Uh, not so cheap, but they work really, really well. If you want to illuminate the inside of a cathedral, for example, um, you can use something like that to fill light into the corners. Very, very helpful. I suggest you take a card reader and card cases. Some people take a couple of card readers. They're inexpensive. Um, and uh, one card reader that I particularly like, and I'm not plugging in the company, um, Lexar makes a card reader that's like a clamshell, and it closes up, and that keeps dirt out of it. I particularly like that kind of design. Well, let's see here. Model release forms. Um, model release forms are great to have with you. If you think that you want to take a photograph that could be a sellable image, and you want a particular person in the photograph, you really do want them to sign a model release form. Um, that gives you the freedom um, to operate with that image as you see fit down the road. And in all honesty, the stock photography houses or a purchaser of a photograph is going to insist that you provide a copy of that model release form before they fork over their money. So. Have, have a half dozen model release forms in all of your bags, and uh, one day they will come in handy. And a little medical kit, a few band-aids, butterfly closures, a little antibiotic ointment, some tweezers. Uh, David mentioned the snake bite kit, um, and he's not that far off because in a few weeks here in California, as the wildflower season progresses, the green rattlesnakes um, uh, come to life and there's millions of baby rattlesnakes running, not running, slithering from place to place in California. Talk about the panorama and the macro mounts. The panorama mount, I'm going to use my pointer here to show you a couple of things. This is actually the two-piece unit. It's, it's the fancier unit. Um, but what this is for is for mounting your camera. This is a clamp and you mount your camera with an Arca Swiss or a Really Right Stuff or a Kirk um, dovetail. And then you mount this part, the bottom also has a dovetail, you mount that on the ball head. And now you can move this back and forth. And I won't get into a super amount of detail here, but what you're doing is you're offsetting the camera so that it's rotating around the optical center of the lens, not around the mount where the screw goes into the camera body. Um, it's going to push the camera back uh, or forward, depending on the camera configuration, at least an inch or so, and depending on the lens. Um, and what will happen is, is this rotating around the optical center is that your panorama frames, whether you know your three or four or five frames, are going to match much more closely than they would if it was handheld or if the camera was simply mounted on the tripod. And again, I also suggest that you mount the camera vertically rather than horizontally, um, and not use a wide-angle lens when you're doing a panorama. Use a normal or a slight telephoto, like a 100 millimeter lens. Um, I have a 100 lens for my camera that does a fabulous job of panoramas. It's completely flat, uh, corner to corner, top to bottom, um, excellent optics, no lens flare, and a good lens shade, and it just does an amazing job. Macro shooting. We've all had this experience with macro shooting. When you put the macro lens on the camera and you put the camera on the tripod, and you get down on the ground and you're trying to take a photograph of this flower and you're trying to focus the lens using the focusing ring. Well, if you've tried it, I think you'll know that I'm, I'm telling the truth here is that really is difficult to get precise focus. And what this is, is a gear-driven mount for your camera that can be moved in tenths of a millimeter at worst forward and backwards. So actually what you do is you get the camera in approximate focus with the focusing ring and then what you do, and of course you're on manual focus, and then what you do is you use that ring on the left. This is mounted on the tripod, this bottom part here. The camera is mounted in this um, well right here and then you use this knob 
to move the camera back and forth to get the precise focus that you want for your macro. And virtually every serious macro photographer out there eventually gets one of these. Tools. Um, just to talk very briefly about tools. Um, you're on your own when you're out in the field. The, the tool kit on the upper left, this is actually a compact bicycle repair kit, but it's got a nice set of hex keys. It's got a screwdriver, a knife, and a couple of small wrenches. Very, very useful. Not very light, but can really be very, very useful. And um, the tripod companies also sell very compact tool kits with a series of screwdriver heads and hex heads. And so having something like this can be extremely useful when you're on your own and there's no help nearby. So let's talk about that panorama mount for a moment. I'm up on a hill. This is a, a, a bay, um, probably 55, 60 minutes south of Big Sur on the northern California coast. And this consists of seven or eight frames taken left to right. Okay, And I use the panorama mount and it was remarkably easy to combine all of these uh, when I got back to the office because they were all lined up. The panorama mount helps you keep the camera level, horizontally and vertically. And so there's no wasted imagery. In other words, I didn't have to crop this much at all to get the full effect of the frame. And I would really have hated to have to crop any closer, particularly on the right here where the clouds are sort of climbing out of the frame. I didn't want to crowd them. And so I shot it with the, uh, the 100 lens. It gave me just enough room to get this range on the right-hand side of the frame um, and to get almost all the way to the beach. And I didn't have to crop this out afterwards because I used that panel rail to control the camera. Very, very useful tool. Good thing to have in your bag if you're out doing um, landscape and scenics. Now, Trek Pack, which is our co-sponsor for this, offers a range of packs and customizable inserts. And I want to talk about this for a moment. Um, there's all kinds of pack designs. You can, you can get everything from one that looks like a, you know, this looks like a mountaineering pack to me. Um, and, you know, they have their inserts and, you know, it's proprietary stuff. But the neat thing about Trek Pack is that these inserts are available separately. You can put them in any pack. You can put them in this pack. And they have a much different system um, than the Velcro setups that you normally see. And I think they're much easier to work with. And you, you should go and take a look at trekpack.com and see how these are set up. Uh, and just take note of all the equipment that actually went into this bag. Now, of course, it's going to make the bag heavy, um, but if you're out there by yourself and you're going to need to carry everything that you're going to be using, um, this is one way to do it. Note the fact that there are two flash units in here, and there is at least it's either an extension tube or a teleadapter, a handheld light meter. I didn't mention that before. Um, a lot of people, it's it's not popular with a lot of people, but uh, I do recommend them. Um, particularly if you're doing, say, architecture, you put a spot metering attachment on it, you're indoors, and you've got a really wide dynamic range. You can meter the brighter and darker areas indoors or even outdoors in a landscape shot. I mentioned the spider checker before. I think the spider checker is an excellent tool for, for color management, particularly if you're working um, um, on a set in the field or in the studio, um, you're going to photograph this and basically profile your camera. Um, this camera calibration software operates as a standalone uh, and it's integrated with Lightroom, Photoshop, and Hasselblad's Focus software. And it generates a robust and tunable custom camera calibration. And again, there's more in detail on this uh, in a couple of webinars on the Data Color website. So. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Here's a quick screenshot of how the software works. Um, and of course, you can use this. Once this is done, it's going to generate a preset for Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. And, and of course, the profile can also be used in Hasselblad Focus. 
LensCal is a device that can help you check the autofocus accuracy of, of any lens camera combination. There are many cameras now that have electronic controls built in that allow you to fine tune the focus point. So you can use this device to determine whether you're focusing in the correct plane, you're back focusing or front focusing and correct it. At worst, you can use this device to evaluate the camera and then send the camera in for adjustment. It's great for field work. A lot of people who go, again, I'll bring up the African safari thing, uh, they take one of these with them because you get banged around a lot, you're on rough terrain, um, you get up in the morning and a couple of critical lenses uh, didn't have such a good day the day before, well, you just check them real quick and you adjust them so that when that lion stands up, you get a great shot of him. And it's a very straightforward five-step process. And so a little story about this photograph. We're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, this is one of those California bumblebees that's about half the size of your thumb. They're really big. And um, I'm not exactly unafraid of them. I think if they stung you, they would, it would hurt a lot. And so instead of using a macro lens and getting two feet away from this guy, I used a 400 lens and I backed up. <laughs> and that lens was pretty new at the time and it was dead on in terms of focus. And this is one of my favorite photographs. Um, it's a macro shot. Um, it's definitely bigger than life size. And it's um, got great bokeh because I was using a lens that um, I think I shot this at about f4. And so, it, you know, that focal plane has to be dead on and the lens cal can help you do that in the field and make sure that it's working correctly for you. So overall I would say planning is key, that thinking ahead is key, and being self-reliant is the name of the game, is that you, you need to have everything you're going to need, hence the checklist, and hence the idea that in some cases you actually have duplicates of some items. And of course you know, you want a bag that's adjustable and that suits the, you know, the job at hand. Larger cases. I have a couple of these. The, the cases are great for, I wanted to talk about these because there's an issue with them. The cases are great for, for, for providing nearly bomb-proof protection for your gear. They've been around for a long time. They're used by all kinds of people. But there's, there's, there's an issue here if they're heavy to begin with. And when you load them up with camera equipment, they're heavy. So they're specialized pieces of equipment. The soft bags give excellent protection. The hard cases give unbelievable protection, but they're not very portable. And you can see that this one even has wheels on it. But you have to climb a flight of stairs or you know, carry it across rough ground or something like that. It's not going to be an easy task, and the really big ones take two people to carry them. So keep that in mind if, if for some reason you're thinking about getting one of these hard shell cases with the, um, you know, with the waterproof seals and all that stuff. That it may be better to get two smaller soft cases than one of these. Okay, so we have a raffle giveaway for a Trek pack with the inserts and a spider cube. And I'm wondering, the winner is Ian Bowie. Ian, um, our marketing manager from Data Color will be getting in touch with you uh, to get your information so that we can ship these items to you promptly. And thank you for attending. A few more uh, bits of information before you go. Um, data color, of course, is www.datacolor.com or spider.datacolor.com. And trekpack, T R E K P A K.com. Um, data color is offering a 20% discount off all spider products purchased at spider.datacolor.com. And the promo code is camera bag 20. And this expires on April 4th. 2013. Uh, again, my name is David Saffer. 
uh, David Saffer Photography. My blog is davidsaffer.wordpress.com. I encourage you to go and look at the blog. There's a lot of good technical how-to tutorial information on there. I also encourage you to sign up for email alerts so that when I publish a new article, um, you can be informed. A lot of good, useful information on there. My website is davidsaffer.com, and I do answer emails with questions. So if you send me an email at dsaffer at mac.com, it may take me a day or so to answer you, but I will answer your questions. If you find that I don't, it either means that I've been on an airplane and I missed it, or that I got a lot of emails and I missed it. Send it again. Don't be shy about that. David Toby also has a superb uh, WordPress uh, blog, cdtoby.wordpress.com, and his website is cdtoby.com. Thank you all for attending. We're going to continue this series throughout the year. Uh, please watch the Data Color website or your email for additional announcements. I guess that wraps it up. Have a great day, everybody.